Hello, class six students. How are you all? So, Prerna ma'am is back again. Why? Because today, in today's class, what are we going to study? We are going to be studying chapter number ten from your textbook, which is on page number eighty-four. And in this chapter, it, we are going to study about the Mauryan Empire, one of the a uh, known empires that has ever ruled india is the mauryan empire now in the previous class in chapter number 9 we studied about magadha correct now we are going to talk about the mauryan empire so you remember we studied how magadha came into existence how it gradually evolved into such a powerful kingdom and then it gradually started weakening and we also heard about how or what we also read about king dhananda being a being one of the most powerful king when it came to the kingdom of magadha but what finally led to a decline you remember we read the reasons in which one of the reasons that we read was the emergence of the mauryan empire which was started by chandragupta maurya so in today's class we are going to be reading the story about the mauryan empire so i want all of you to open your textbooks to chapter number 10 which is on page number 84 all right come on all of you have done that very good so before i start with the chapter an important concept that you would have uh, probably come across in the previous chapters it's about dates bce ad so what exactly are these dates and you would have noticed that bc or bce is something that we read backwards so we say someone ruled from 100 uh, from 1100 bc to 1500 uh, sorry from 1500 bc to 1100 bc so something which is going backwards why is that that i'm going to explain in today's class right okay so you see this line this is a kind of a timeline okay so assuming that this is the timeline okay so this is a line so if you see what are we doing so this is the center of the line or let me hold it like this this point this is the center of the line all of you can see the center is zero okay now if you look at this line on one side you uh, what is it that you see you will notice here like you notice on one side the numbers are in decreasing order here you see that the numbers are in ascending order why is that because this bc period or bce period we intend to come to the middle point that is zero that is why we start with reverse counting so we, that's why i gave you an example that we say that someone ruled from 1500 to 1100 bc why why are we moving in reverse order because we are trying to reach this point zero and after the zero point we start with the ascending order which is on the other side of the line so bc or bce is before christ then you have the center and then after there that is after christ so basically this is the common era and this towards this side you see the numbers increasing towards this side the numbers are in decreasing order here is the statement also that we have written why do we count backwards for bce dates when we count dates in ancient history the dates often appear backwards to us example 30000 to 20000 this is because these dates happen before zero before the year zero so we are counting forward towards zero because like i already told you we are trying to reach towards zero that is why we are counting backwards or in reverse order okay so because this is an important part and i uh, thought that you know at least you should be aware of it that's why i have uh, uh, given you this explanation now coming back to the story of the mauryan empire okay so when we talk about the mauryan empire we talk about three main rulers who were these three main rulers so you have chandragupta maurya you have bindusara and then you have ashoka the great what were the time periods in which they ruled let's find that out okay so coming back to your textbook 
so here is a table which is given in your book so it says chandragupta maurya he ruled from 321 to 297 bc see what are we doing we are moving backwards because we have to reach till the center point that is the year 0 then bindusara he ruled from 297 to 272 bc and ashoka the great he ruled from 272 bc e to 232 bc e and like i've been telling you in all your previous classes the only way to understand or to learn dates in history is through making tables like you do in maths and science how do you learn formulas you probably make tables or you make shortcuts out of them so basically three rulers and how do you remember the sequence c b a chandragupta maurya bindusara and ashoka the great and then 321 to 297 297 to 272 272 to 232 okay these were and bc is of course eh? these were the years in which they ruled so let us start understanding now more about these kings so we are going to first study about chandragupta maurya okay so before we start uh, understanding about chandragupta maurya we need to know something more about king dhananda so king dhananda of the magadha empire he was not a people's king at all he was someone who was very cruel very self centered he would only uh, you know look for his personal gain he never really cared about the kingdom or rather the people the subjects he never really cared about them so basically what happened that you know one day when king dhananda was trying to show off uh, that he's very intelligent he's very prosperous and uh, you know he's he's the king of kings at that time a very learned sage called chanakya we all have heard of him so very he's a, he was a very learned sage he came to king dhananda and he interrupted and he said that you know what king the way you rule is not the correct manner and moreover as a king you cannot be self centered you need to first think about the welfare of your people you cannot be storing wealth at your uh, in your kingdom and uh, you know not thinking about those who are in need what about them so king dhananda being very egoistic and you know thinking that he's right and rest everyone is wrong he insulted chanakya at that time and he in show and and you know what he did he threw chanakya out of his court so he told his soldier that you know throw this man out of my court i don't want such a fool like him around my in and around my kingdom also so chanakya who was a very learned sage he was taken aback he was completely shocked by it and he could not take that insult and therefore he challenged king dhananda that i chanakya i'm going to raise a king who is going to beat you who is going to defeat you and beat you lot like beating someone in sense of defeating the king so he said i am chanakya said that i'm going to raise a king who is going to defeat you who is going to bring you down on your knees and who is going to rule on the entire india on the entire country so king dhananda probably uh, you know pos uh, possessed by some uh, uh, kind of uh, you know being self centered his ego he uh, did not pay any heed to this challenge and he thought that oh this is just a normal uh, you know sage or a normal teacher what can he do and he threw chanakya out of his so when chanakya was in this state he, he was filled with anger and you know he was very devastated he was completely shocked so one day chanakya saw this boy playing with his friends who was this boy this boy was chanakya uh, was chandragupta so chanakya saw this boy chandragupta a little boy when he was playing with his uh, friends the manner in which he conducted himself during the entire game chanakya was impressed by him and he started training this young boy called chandragupta to become the king of the country and chandragupta did not belong to any royal family this is an important fact that you need to know chandragupta never belonged to any uh, royal family he was he belonged to a very normal family and he was raised he was trained 
by Chanakya to become the king. So this is Chanakya. So this is about Chandragupta Maurya, how he became the king. And the beauty of the uh, manner in which Ch uh, Chanakya had trained Chandragupta was that he did not train Chandragupta only in terms of fighting battles. He even trained Chandragupta in terms of administration, how a proper administration should be, how the economy should be like, how do you become a people's king. So in all aspects of uh, you know, ruling of uh, what are the various political aspects, social aspects, and economic aspects of a country. If you want, if you're wanting to rule a country, you should know these three. You should be excellent in these three domains. So Chanakya trained this young boy called Chandragupta in all these domains, and it was a mind you, it was a very tough training that he had to go through. If you ever get a chance, you must watch this serial uh, called Chanakya in which you will see how he trained Chandragupta to become a king. So now we are going to read something from your textbook about Chandragupta more. Okay. Okay. So Chandragupta Maurya, after the death of Alexander the Great, nobody could keep his vast empire united for long. So his generals fought among themselves to have large areas under their control. One such general was Seleucus I Nicator, who controlled a large area which was stretching from present day, like today it is West Asia and northwestern parts of Indian subcontinent. After becoming the king, Chandragupta fought with Seleucus I and defeated him, thus establishing his supremacy in this region. And then he also signed a treaty with Seleucus I. So just now I told you that Chandragupta was trained effectively to become a king. So Chandragupta was also trained that when you uh, defeat another king, it's not necessary that you have to always punish him. Try and see how probably that enmity can be converted into friendship and how the two of you can gain from it. So in this treaty, Seleucus one, he gave away Punjab, Kabul, Kandar and Persia to Chandragupta. And in return, Chandragupta gave the Greek general 500 elephants as a royal gift. And Niketa, he also gave his daughter Helen's hand in marriage to Chandragupta and sent Megasthenes as the Greek ambassador to Chandragupta's court. So whenever we need to study or how historians have studied about Chandragupta Maurya, how the administration was, how the economy was, how the polity was, how the society was, it is through the records of the Greek ambassador Megasthenes. Okay, and the book he wrote was Indica and he stayed in India, Megasthenes stayed in India for a good 22 years and he wrote all that he observed about India and he wrote a lot about how the country was actually ruled and says Chandragupta was an efficient ruler, he maintained a strong army and he established good trade and diplomatic relations with foreign powers like Egypt, Syria, Rome, Greece and China and he embraced Jainism. Correct? So this is about Chandragupta Maurya, how he became the king and what kind of rule did he establish. Now let's read about Chandragupta, uh, Chandragupta successor Bindusara. Okay. So see these were the areas that they started ruling. So Bindusara, he ruled from 297 to 272 BC and his empire included the whole of India except the Rhine of Palinga and the Dravidin, which were the kingdoms of the south. He also maintained and improved the relations that Chandragupta had established with the foreign empire. So like father, like son. So Bindusara also continued establishing harmonious relationships with the bordering kingdoms and also taking care of the effective administration within the kingdom. Then came Ashoka the Great who ruled from 272 to 232 BC. So when we talk about Ashoka the Great, we also talk about Kalinga, how the war of Kalinga became a turning point. But what exactly was Kalinga? Why was it so important? Let's read that first. So Kalinga had control over land and sea routes to South India and Southeast Asia. So this clearly shows that Kalinga was an important point of trade. Ashoka wanted to conquer Kalinga to have control over these routes to increase the moral trade. Obviously, to increase the economy, he wanted to uh, basically, uh, you know, 
uh, wanted to have control over Kalinga. So in 261 BC, he invaded Kalinga and the Kalinga king and his people fought back. They did not like anyone ruling over them, but they could not stand the might of Ashoka's large army and were defeated. So what exactly happened in this Kalinga war? It's, it is but obvious that Ash Ashoka and his army, they were able to defeat the people of Kalinga. But, you know, after his victory, you know, when Ashoka was going back to his kingdom to celebrate it, that, you know, wow, now I'm going to have control over um, uh, Kalinga and I'm going to control the trade. I'm going to, uh, you know, help the economy of the kingdom grow. So while he was celebrating this victory and on his way back, he came across a sight which disturbed him completely. He was really taken aback. He, he became extremely overwhelmed on seeing that. What was it? So he saw thousands and thousands of dead bodies being burned. And he saw widow ladies, young children crying for their loved ones. So when Ashoka asked someone that, you know, who is responsible for this? So some person from Kalinga said that, you know, oh, this is King Ash Ashoka and his army who have uh, brought in so much of loss for our area. So King Ashoka, for a second, he stood still because he could not believe that just with the idea or just, just with the aim of, uh, you know, ruling or capturing a particular place so as to increase economy, it meant so much of, so much of loss of human life. So this really disturbed Ashoka and that is why the Kalinga War became the turning point in Ashoka's life because he gave up war then and there and he moved on to the path of dharma or dham. What was that? So first we need to understand dham or dharma. What does it mean? It's a Pali word which means religious or moral duty. Ashoka's dham included the teachings of the Buddha and many principles of Hinduism and other religions. After the adoption of Buddhism, Ashoka gave up the policy of conquest of territories through war, that is Degvijay. And what did he adopt? He adopted the policy of conquest through dharma, through moral or religious duty, which is called as dham vijay. So he gave up the policy of Degvijay and adopted dham vijay. What were the other features of Ashoka Dham? So uh, majorly, these features were influenced by Buddhism. You have read in, you know, that how Buddhism always talked about spreading peace. So what were the key points? To live in peace and harmony with fellow human beings. To show love and compassion for all. That is to care for all those who are around us. Follow non-violence towards all living creatures. Show tolerance and respect to all religion, that is being secular, that is not disrespecting any religion at all. Having equal respect, the amount of respect that I have for my religion, I should have the same amount of respect for someone else's religion as well. Treat elders with respect, give love and care to children. So here he's talking the key to a harmonious family. And be kind to servants and slaves. Now, this point is something that I really wanted to discuss with all of you. I become very sad, you know, when I see certain people and including children as well. So, you, we all have domestic help who come to our place, you know. And it's, it's, it's very sad to see that, you know, the, uh, the way we treat them. They are also human beings. And why don't we ever realize that, you know, they are the ones who, who are making our life so easy. We all uh, saw what happened during the pandemic, during the lockdown, that there were no domestic help and everything we had to do on our own. Was it so easy? It was incorrect. So please, you know, make sure that you always have respect for your domestic help. In the summers, how many of us, you know, when they come to our place for work, how many of us offer water to them? It's so hot outside. We can't stand even for a minute. But they are coming. They are going from one house to another. So they are also tired. And anyways, it's so hot. At least we should have the courtesy, the compassion to ask them or to, uh, you know, offer them a glass of water. Then 
a uh, very important point uh, about ashoka's teaching was he said that a king he is like a father for his subjects so what is the role of the father what is the responsibility or what is the uh, attribute of a father that he is very caring towards the entire family in some cases we might say that he is strict but that's that's why is that because that is for the welfare of the family so he said that a king is like a father whose key responsibility is to take care of his subjects then ashoka he also commissioned the construction of roads waterways canals hospitals rest houses for travelers and other public works so basically ashoka ensured that the infrastructure development is done for the welfare of the people so there are hospitals there are medical facilities there are education facilities there are agricultural facilities who is going to be benefited obviously the general public and then his officials they visited people in different parts of the empire to listen to their problems and solve them so imagine ashoka was so dedicated towards his subjects towards the general public that he had officers who would go to different towns different villages and speak to people about what their problems were bring those problems to the king and then a decision was taken as to what can be the best solution to these problems now we talk about the mauryan administration so i've already told you that chanakya had beautifully trained chandragupt to become a uh, become an effective ruler and this is where we talk about the mauryan administration because it was through the training that chanakya gave that chandragupt understood how proper administration should be uh, executed in the empire so as to ensure the success of the empire okay so now we come to your book you can see that the uh, basically the empire it was divided into several provinces okay so let us come back to our text okay so patliputra which was the capital of the mauryan empire it was divided into four provinces the capital of the four provinces were tosli in the east ujjain in the west uh, suvarnagiri in the south and taksila in the north then the provinces they were further divided into districts and the district consisted of nagar that is the towns and the gram the administration of the empire was primarily supervised by two levels of government so there was a central government and then there was a provincial provincial government like we have the central government today and the state government and yes of course very important point that partly put to was paid special attention to then central government it enjoyed supreme power it was headed by the uh, sorry it uh, it was uh, the king who enjoyed the central uh, the supreme power in the central government and he was also the supreme head of the army then the king utilized the service of mantri parishad that is the council of ministers we have council of ministers even today the kumars and the officials called mahamatras to run the administration provincial government it was the government in provinces and these were assisted by council of ministers and mahamatras who were head of district so like i told you that special attention was given to Pat patliputra being the capital army and spy system now this is very interesting okay so of course the mauryans we know they had a so this is the division of the mauryan administration so central government divided into further divided into provinces and district and district divided into towns and villages so they are uh, talking about the army so the mauryan army it was a very long standing army there were a lot of infantry cavalry and uh, you know they they had sufficient army in terms of fighting a battle then there was a separate wing altogether which took care of the supply of goods and production of weapons for the soldiers the mauryan king that also developed a good spy system so what was interesting about the spy system was that different spies were sent to different parts of the country and these spies did not keep a check on the people not on the general public they kept an eye on the working of the officials so they saw that if the of whether the officials that are appointed by our king are they performing their duties properly or not okay then we talk about the mauryan society we get an idea 
of the class division of the modern society from megasthenes book in the i told you that he stayed here for 22 years and he listed seven classes of the modern society these were brahmans kshatriyas vaishyas councillors peasants artisans and shepherds then we talk about economy so again agriculture was the main occupation and land revenue was the chief source of income for the state therefore farmers were provided irrigation facilities we studied that canals waterways all these were provided and other occupations were production of arms and agricultural implements trade mining for uh, trade and mining forestry etc now we also talk about the modern architecture so first of all what we need to know is that it was greatly influenced by the buddhist art the ashokan pillar numerous stupas sculptures cave residence of aesthetic aesthetic sorry etc they stand out as the fine example of the modern art the tall ashokan pillar which is made out of a single stone which was cut shaped and polished one such pillar was erected at sarnath in uttar pradesh the top portion of the uh, pillar which is called the lion capital how many lions it has four so it is basically four lions standing back to back like basically like this and it now forms the national symbol of india this is the ashokan pillar or the lion capital correct so we all know that this is also the national emblem another masterpiece of the modern art is the stupa at sanchi which is now declared as the world heritage site by unesco so we know that stupa stupa is a dome like structure basically it's a monastery kind of a place where the people who practice buddhism they come and they chant okay so despite this entire success there were some weaknesses in the modern empire which led to its decline what were these so after the death of ashoka in 232 bce the modern empire lasted only for 50 years so that means only till 282 bc due to succession of the weak modern rulers king bridhartha murdered his own commander in chief pushmitra singha who founded the new dynasty other reasons that these were success these successes they were not efficient enough to take care of the large empire their control over the distant areas of the empire slowly declined the large modern empire it became weak and inefficient in state treasury and then there were inefficient kings and weak army so basically the army weakened the economy also weakened due to which the modern empire saw its decline so this is the story of the modern empire but i really want all of you to watch the story of chandragupta maurya it is a very interesting story you can trust me on this i can vouch for it you are really going to enjoy watching the story of chandragupta maurya however what are you going to do now you going to read the chapter again watch the video again and then answer the questions on your own till then bye bye my dear students